um, please make sure that you're on mute. Because of the number of people we have here, we're gonna be using the chat box. I'm gonna ask you not to take yourselves off mute um, during the talk with Peter, um, but put your questions in the chat. People love seeing your comments to the chat. Um, I've been shocked at how much people are loving the chat feature on Zoom. So feel free to um, you know, chat it up there so that you guys can hear from each other. Uh, just looking across this beautiful spectrum of tiles on my screen, Peter, we have some of the kindest, <laughs> most visionary, and most service-oriented people on this call. These are the kind of people you wanna be uh, on your team. And thank you for being on our team today. In the way of introduction, uh, Dr. Peter Bishop, in addition to being my teacher at the University of Houston in the, in the Futures program, he has been a, a faculty member for our Futurist Camp. Um, in times when you feel like you're on your back leg, it's very natural for us to reach out to the people who have been our mentors um, to impart words of wisdom. And Peter is the first person I thought to call. And I thought, wow, maybe he would even be willing to talk to this broad community of change makers and future thinkers. So Peter, Thank you so yep. much for being with us. Oh, it's my pleasure, Rebecca. It's wonderful. I mean, in describing the group, you also described yourself. So <laughs> obviously, the group the group emulates <laughs> its its leader, and, and you've assembled obviously a great group of people just like yourself. That's terrific. Oh well, um, I've got a few questions for you, Peter. They're big questions. Absolutely. You can take uh, as much time as you want with them, and I know that our people. Are going to have questions for you as well. That's the way it should be a conversation. Absolutely, know. you got it. Okay, I, so I left my I left my uh, my PowerPoints back in the in the garage. And it's all it's all full of virus, so I can't use PowerPoint. Oh, fantastic! Well, this is this is intentionally a PowerPoint free zone. Um, I, I want to just start with an opening comment. You know, Peter, one of the reasons I wanted to have a conversation with you is because before you sort of became the godfather of foresight programs uh, on the mainland, you know, you back in the day had considered going to seminary. And mm -hmm. I think that's really important for us right now to be grounded in our thinking in a way that is more than just intellectual. And so for me, that's one of the reasons you're also a mentor is because I think you're able to think about the whole person. You're able to think about, um, decisions and their implications in a way that's not just um, academic. And so I want to start with this question about, um, you know, this could be an opportunity where we move from now to next, where we move from what was to what could be, uh, from X to Y, if you, if you want to make it super generic. And from your perspective, what do you think we're moving from to? Wow. Well, you know, I'm a futurist, Rebecca, so I'm not going to give you an answer to that. Uh, I have to give you multiple answers to that. And so uh, let's just set the stage. We're obviously in a time of disruption. And disruption is a technical term in our field. Uh, it is a type of change, a change that occurs suddenly and has the potential and often does have enormous consequences. Uh, we distinguish disruptions from trends. Uh, trends are slower uh, over long periods of time. They also create change and in the long run can be as significant as disruptions. But right now we're obviously in the middle of a huge disruption. Uh, there is a slide that I use that shows what the disruptions that I think have been since the 1970s. Uh, beginning with uh, the Vietnam War in the U.S., uh, beginning the Arab oil embargo, Watergate, hyperinflation, blah, 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 all the way through the fall of the Soviet Union, the appearance of the internet, the various wars, the 9-11 attacks, and lastly, the Great Recession. So th this goes down now on that list. This is a time of tremendous disruption. Uh, that means uh, one of two things, and the fundamental scenario is, will this make a difference or not? Because to, to our surprise, there are disruptions that don't make a difference. There are disruptions where the system basically snaps back. 
I would say that, uh, that at the financial services level, that's exactly what happened in the recession. The banks were bailed out, everybody went back to normal, and we have a financial system that's as big, if not bigger, than it was before the recession. And in that sense, nothing has changed. A lot has changed because people lost their homes and, 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 and they were out on the street, et cetera, et cetera. So for the, for the population, a lot changed. And I think that led to a lot of the political situation we have today, that anger and that frustration and that disappointment uh, led to people basically taking it out on, on the government. But um, that aside, uh, there is a lot more similar after the recession than before. Um, that was not true, I would say, in the 70s. And that was not true, certainly for the appearance of the internet, which itself was another disruption that, that the World Wide Web basically appeared in the 1990s. So that has changed all of our lives. Um, so if, if this were to be a disruption that changes things, where are the, uh, where are the points that it could change? Um, you know that we use an acronym uh, called STEEP, social, technological, economic, environmental, and political. So what I use is kind of a checklist. So what are the changes that could be social, uh, social changes? Well, uh, we have, in one sense, gotten closer to certain numbers of people, like our families, and we have gotten farther away from others. Uh, there was a little uh, uh, weak signal, we call it, uh, that came out of China that as soon as they opened up the doors, the, the divorce rate spiked. <laughs> Some folks who were putting off and putting up with people, having to be with them for a month uh, over there, uh, figured now that I'm gonna throw in the towel on this. So not predicting that, but there could be some social consequences to this. Um, and in that sense, uh, we're, we're and, and will there be a change in, in our attitude towards public health? Uh, certainly we are, we were not prepared for this. I don't think anybody claims we were prepared for this. And so sh would we do that? That's, that's actually a whole different discussion about preparing for disruptions that are not guaranteed. How do we do that? Well, we do that by spending time, money, talent, attention on things which we can't guarantee are not going to, uh, not going to occur and people like yourselves who have public resources at your disposal, are you going to invest to protect yourselves against, or in your communities, against an event which frankly is unlikely to happen? That's a very tough sell because you have to take resources away from the present, present needs, present constituents present problems, present, present goals and, and, and that, and put that money aside. Now, we should all do that in a sense of being prudent. We need to prepare for college, kids' college education, buying the home, one of us gets sick, retirement ultimately, all of those kinds of things. And most of us do that in a prudent kind of a way. But you cannot prepare for everything, mm -hmm. and one can't, can't use all one's resources in the moment to uh, to prepare for all the eventualities that are coming along. So uh, there, there was a, some back of the envelope calculation that if we had invested in you know, hundreds of thousands of ventilators in preparing for this, we would save X number of lives. Well, of course we would. But did we have, did, did we have the motivation and the resources to prepare to, to, to buy all that and spend that money that way. So to me, that's a big issue. And you, you guys confront that issue every single day in your jobs. Where's, how much in the present and how much in the future? Peter, so that's a, that could be a social consequence. Yeah, and you can go right through that steep um, list and kind of think through every one of the possible implications. I do wanna ask you about this. Um, you know, in the same way that people sometimes don't buy fire insurance or flood insurance until they've had a fire or a flood. I mean, what you're describing with putting some money aside to deal with um, improbable but high impact events, that's kind of like insurance, you know? It is insurance, exactly. Um, it is that. And I wonder if, um, if in your experience after a big event like this, is there an increased interest in insurance? I mean, I just think about all the people who've been through Futurist Camp. 
right? They've got some skills. They've got some ability to help their organizations think a, more, a bit more futuristically. Is now the time that they might want to say, hey, guys, if we put a little bit of money into this budget, we could kind of be better prepared uh, down, down the line. There's, again, that's, that's a possibility. Um, I don't, I, but the problem still exists. You're going to have to take money away from, and, and now we've got maybe less of it than we had before because people are out of work. Taxes are, are basically going away. Uh, so we have fewer resources than before. So making that case, I don't want to be, you know, a downer on this, but making that case is no easier, even though we realize that, yes, we could have bought insurance against this. How many other things should we buy insurance against? Climate, you know, abrupt climate change, or, you know, some kind of um, nuclear disaster, or, you know, you name it, go down the list, uh, some kind of outbreak of, of true mental health or whatever. So we can list all of the wild cards and all of the potential disruptions, and yet I don't think the case can be made on every one of those and how much of those. So I think the other part, is this and this is the term that comes along is resilience if you cannot prevent or even prepare adequately for all of the contingencies in the future how do you prepare when you can't do that and that's a matter of uh, resilience is a very very topical word these days it's um it's basically being able to live and survive a disruption that you're not completely prepared for, which is almost by definition, you can't be. So how does one get in, in from a futurist point of view, and you talk about your futures camp, scenarios promote resilience. Scenarios are imagining ourselves in an alternate universe almost, in an alternate world, and not that we're gonna do anything about it. We could create contingency plans if we thought it was important enough and it was probable enough, but even thinking about it, creates a resilient attitude. Okay, well, I didn't expect this to come, but I'm capable, I'm confident, we can move ahead. Uh, what is the, uh, the phrase from one of the founders of the Shell Scenario Program that learning is the only competitive advantage in an environment of rapid and turbulent change? Learning, being ready to change, and I call it conditioning. I, you can call it resilience, that you are conditioned to notice change, not, not deny it, and notice the ability to move when the time comes. So this is where futures thinking in your camp has produced, you're right, a, a cadre of people, presumably who are thinking more resiliently and are in better shape, both mental shape and cognitive shape and emotional shape to say, wow, my world just fell apart and now I'm doing something else. Well, okay, I've been there before mentally, now I'm gonna be there physically, Let's go. Yeah, exactly. I just added to the chat a week ago or a week and a half ago, I did a webinar sort of like this on scenario planning for anxious times and invited people to walk through the three zones. I think it was really therapeutic for some of us because we had all been in the doomsday. Many people had been in the doomsday. We go to that negative place. And by causing us to have to look at a more hopeful future, um, I think it was somewhat therapeutic for folks. And, and Peter, I wonder, you know, this week, I've been talking a lot about sense making, uh, how we're making sense of what's happening. And I know one of the things that I've done is I've gathered this little group of subject matter experts on local government, and we talk every Monday, Wednesday, Friday for a half an hour. What are you hearing? What am I hearing? What do we think is missing? And I'll be honest, just about everything that I've developed over the last two weeks is because of that group talking about what was needed. You know, I'm trying to be nimble, right? But in the sense making of a disruption like this, you know, what are the signals that people should be looking for? What would be the things that as you're on the wave, you know, if you think about the pandemic wave, the crest that we're all trying to flatten, we're all, most of us are not in New York City. The people who are in New York City don't have time for this damn webinar. They're doing other things, right? So for those of us who are still on the upside, what, how should we be making sense of this time? Who should we be talking to? What should we be thinking about so that when we come out of it, we're better equipped for, for recovery? 
Well, it's, it's very hard to be thinking about the future at this moment in the, in the, in the midst of a crisis and the midst of emergencies. Uh, I guess if I were to um, be a little Zen for a moment, uh, reflecting and, and on our abilities, reflecting on our resiliency, reflecting on our conditioning, reflecting on our ability to notice change and take appropriate and timely action when it's called for, not all the time, but, but when it's right, and when it's right is always a, a judgment call. So I think what, what I would like to do is to put those reflections into the bank so that when times calm down, we can look back and say, how, how did we do? And, and what should we, and not just, not just personally, but in the systems that we're all involved in. How did our cities do? How did our businesses do? How did uh, the, the other government agencies that you deal with, how did we do and what can we do to make a difference? Because as you know, Rebecca, we, we talk about two uh, sources of change. Uh, one is inbound and the other is outbound. And the inbound change is the virus. It came to us. We didn't have any choice. We had no influence. It is what it is. But, but there is a kind of a, a bright spot. And that is that when these thing, things happen, the existing structures, as you already know, basically fall apart. They become, ter they bec the membranes basically become permeable. And we can begin to move in directions that would be unheard of uh, three months ago, six months ago. Now people are, are kind of thrown back. Wow, we can't say, well, this is the way we've always done it before because now that's not true. This is not the way we've always done it before. So if you have aspirations, frankly, and, and it's not time to act on them at this point because people are in emergency mode, but right afterwards, if you have aspirations, this is the time to strike. This is the time to move. This is the time to be bold, time to make proposals, time to try and create change not just react to change, but actually create change in whatever way uh, could be. And so uh, there is that more hopeful, I'm glad you, you're doing that. I'm working with a, gr a group out of New Zealand that put up a website for, for students actually, for young people, called Bright Spots. And it's just an attempt to get, get, get what I deal with mostly is educators and, 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 and young people and get them to be looking for the signs of change that are more positive during this time of dread and this time of doom and gloom, yeah. there are some bright spots out there. So uh, I, I think this is a time to be present in the moment as a way of storing up our experiences so that when we have the time and have the bandwidth to make change, we can re reflect on what, what, how resilient are we? how much in condition are we for, for doing change? You know, one of the things that I worry about, um, and it's, it's kind of the subtext for our, our talk here, is for, for those of you who are on that scenario planning webinar with me, you know that when we talked about the zone of high aspiration, many people's high aspiration was, well, it's gonna go back to normal. And I recognize that in two ways. One is that when people are afraid, they they tunnel. And uh, the, the past always feels more safe than an uncertain future. And so I think it's human nature to say, well, the best we can hope for is to go, to go back to, to the way it was. And frankly, that just was insufficient for me. Mm -hmm. um, but then my colleague Yasmin said, um, well, we have to remember that people don't do their most creative thinking when they're under stress. So what is our responsibility to help people think more imaginatively? So we are working on some of those things right now, but Peter, I think this, this leads me to the question that is kind of keeping me up at night right now, which is eventually we will be through the hump or the double hump of COVID. Mm -hmm. And if all we do is snap back, what have we really gained? We know that there are broken systems that are just patched together by gravitational force. <laughs> you know, we know that there are um, structural inequalities. We all know the list. I don't need to put all the words on it. But what are the things that, so it's a two part question. Number one is, how do we help our organizations think? about a more visionary future that back to normal isn't 
as visionary as we can be? How do we lift our eyes higher? And then the second part of that question would be, and what can we do? I mean, you pointed to it a bit because you said, hey, now is the time. Now is the time for bold action. Now is the time. But I wonder if you might even be a little more specific or give some examples of things that you've seen um, in your own career. Well, I, I, I think, I mean, outbound change begins with the concept of leadership. Uh, not leadership as people who are authorities, as you are, most of you are, I'm sure, but people who are committed and enroll others in a campaign to accomplish something of significance. So I, I, during, and you know, during the programs that we teach, there's a challenge in there. So what are you committed to? What is your, uh, what, what would you be a leader to? We do the appreciative inquiry exercise, which gives people a chance to talk to one other person about their highest aspiration. If I really did commit to something or I am committed to something, this is what it is. So I think that everybody has to kind of answer that for themselves. I obviously want to use this in my work to bring futures thinking to schools, which is what I do today. And, and so I will use this experience. Are we preparing students to be resilient? Are we preparing students to be conditioned for change? Or are we simply in, indoctrinating them, so to speak, into the past and into the traditions of, you know, only that? So there is, there's value to the past, there's value to tradition, but there's also value to critically thinking about that, questioning that. So I'm gonna use this obviously as a big example of where we should be teaching this stuff ahead of time, not afterwards. But I think each of you that I see on the screen, and it is glorious, uh, has to answer that for themselves. What am I, what am I committing to? What, what single most important thing do I wanna come out of this with? And respectfully, first by asking questions, do we really want to just get the past back? Um, it was good, it was fine, but it was not great. <laughs> and do we want to be great? And that's where the high aspirational part comes in. So I think, I, I don't think I can answer that for people in general. I think each of us has to kind of look in the mirror and say, what am I going to do afterwards? How am I going to be different personally? You know, Mahatma Gandhi be the change. What am I, how am I going to be more resilient and more futures oriented? because of this experience and how can I enroll others and in, encourage others and support others in being that way that, uh, that we were not, we didn't have the motivation to do it before. So I think I, I, can, I can't answer the question in specifics, but I do believe this is an opportunity for all of us to say, I have a window of, uh, because the existing structures are beginning to melt are beginning to collapse and, and, and they, they will form up again. There, it is a window, it's not forever. There will be a new era and that new era will have just as many obstacles to change as the old era is. So this is the time when, when, when the unfreezing is going on, when the, when the destructive part of creative destruction is happening. So we now need to add the creativity to, to that and, and each, each in his, her own way, each institution, each organization commits to doing something so much different than it was before that will create a better world. And that's, yeah. that's that unfortunately is a very generic answer, but that's my answer to the question, yeah. what should we do after? You know, we, um, we put, I put the question in the chat for everybody to consider, like, what are they committed to? And I, I wanna offer a short reflection on this. Um, on, on uh, Friday the 13th of March, my dojo did its first online zazen, its first online meditation. And, uh, you know, we did that because we couldn't meet, but we also did that because we had a real sense that people were going to need to sit quietly once or twice a day just to remember who they really are um, and to, to center down. And I remember one of our Roshi's uh, Zen masters saying, um, this, I want to be open to letting this pandemic change me. You know, and I think one of the things I've noticed about human behavior is that um, I'll give a very specific example. One of our clients has a city manager who is um, exceptionally like rainbows and unicorns. Like he never seems to be having a bad day and everything is always awesome. And what that has made him a very effective leader prior to March 24th. And because it has served him so well, he has this natural 
inclination to kind of hang on to that. Like everything's still fine. Like he's continuing to pass the budget that was proposed several months ago. Anyway, you can see the expression. But that, that's an example of not being conditioned for change, not right. being aware that things are changing. And, and people can be both uh, in a positive mode like that. They can be in a negative mode like that. They can be in whatever mode. They are not flexible. They're not resilient. They're not adaptable. And yeah, there are many people like that. I, the best way to do it is for us to be the, the flexible, adaptable, resilient people and offer that as an attitude, offer that as a behavior to our colleagues. I think that's about the only thing. Yeah, and, and what I would, just wanted to add to that was as, as we watch leaders whose style uh, is ill-suited to this disruptive time when we're trying to make sense of things, I think we need to allow them the grace that their style is gonna break down. They're gonna meet themselves or they're gonna come up against something from their teams. This is bigger than us. And they're gonna recognize that they don't have the equipment. That's not their right handedness. It's not their normal handedness to do it the way they always have. And I think we're gonna to have to allow them some grace, but also be ready to help. You know, so it is the adaptive among us, the, the ones who can live in an ambiguous time, the ones who maybe have natural sense-making connections to help others make sense of this, who can help even our, our leaders who were very effective in a previous moment, but who are gonna run up against themselves. I guess all of that is just to say that um, we're gonna see people fail. Uh, or run up against themselves. And we do need to offer some grace and then quickly some perspective. Listen, here's something that we could do that would be useful um, when and, the stuff you've always used doesn't. And it's, it goes without saying, and I'm sure you would say it if, you, if, you, if, if I didn't jump in here, give ourselves the same grace to be, to be wrong, to yeah. be uh, upset, to have to give up things that we cherish that are familiar. Uh, not that we're going to throw over our whole lives, but there are some fundamental things uh, that we are going to have to readjust our own thinking. So almost teaching by example, not just by rushing out and helping people do that themselves or supporting them, which of course is wonderful, but supporting ourselves in doing that and showing others our vulnerability that we're, in, we're involved in change as well, not just helping others who are involved in change. So yeah. it goes both ways. Both yeah, ways. That's a great reminder. Thank you. Peter, so, there, there have been some questions and comments please. in the chat box. I want to I want to yeah. um, bring these out. So adaptive planning, you know, the idea that yeah. you have a plan, but by tomorrow it's it's irrelevant yeah. and that you have right. to make that decisive action at the right time. And Andrew's asking, do you have a sense of when the right time is? Uh, of course not. I mean, you, we know that in terms of investment, it's not what you invest in. It's when <laughs> timing is everything. And so the, uh, and there is a right time, but uh, what people say, trying to time the market in investments is a, is a failing strategy. You're not gonna do it. The way we time change is what I believe is by having a discussion, if not an argument about fundamental change. There are two questions that always get people upset and, and in, engage, but yet engaged in change. And there's how much and how, and, 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 how, and, and how fast. So how much are we really going to have to change to adapt to this new, new whatever world comes about? And there are people who uh, will say, we can snap back, go right back to where we were before, everything will be fine, and they're wrong. And there are people who say, basically, we blow up the whole system and start over, and they're wrong. So getting them off those opposite poles is the first job. If the people who want to snap back say, do you admit that there could be some change happening here that's fundamental and permanent? Okay, I admit just a little bit. <laughs> and then for the people who want to blow it up, you say, isn't there some value that we want to try and retain? Well, yeah, a little bit. So we get them off the poles, off the absolutes of zero to 100% and onto the five and 95%. And now we have a discussion. How much of this is going, and, and, and it's best if you have both of those kinds of people, plus people in the middle, involved in the discussion. Because we know from small group research, people who are in those discussions make better decisions than the best person 
in the discussion. This was first demonstrated to me with a little exercise that was, you have 10 things that you could take to the moon, rank them in terms of how useful they are and how useless they are. And the first one, of course, is oxygen, most useful, and the least useful is matches. <laughs> so so it, it, you rank that. And when you, when you run this in a small group, you have everybody fill it out for themselves, then you have them talk about it, and they come up with a, with a joint list. The joint list is always better than the, in, the best individual list in the group. So it is a matter of discussion. How much? How much are we going to change? Not everything, but some. And how fast? We, we may need to do it now. We may need to monitor. We may need to move. It's now time. And there are people on both sides of that discussion, and presumably people in the middle, and coming up with a consensus joint decision to me is the answer to the how much and the how fast questions. One of the questions we've had is about like the future of relationships, you know, so as we think about, and maybe this is tied to the comment about the social and steep, um, but what are, what do you think about how we're going to be relating to each other in the future? Wow, that one, that one, you know, sets me back. <laughs> um, I think, I think we will have a narrative because Frankly, I mean, all of this, uh, you know, stay at home orders and shelter in place orders and things like that. Uh, as far as I know, hardly anybody, anybody is enforcing any of that. This is all done on a voluntary basis. Those of us who believe this is a serious crisis need to stay away from other people, people whom we love. Uh, and we're going to do that for a while. And if we come out of it, okay despite the immense deaths that are going to happen for those who survive, we're going to reflect on that, that we did this together. We didn't do this as a set of individuals. I didn't shelter in place only for myself. I mean, my wife has taken care of our 14 month old granddaughter three days a week up until March 1st. And we haven't seen her and we'll see her for another month or two months. Mm -hmm. So we love them, but we are, taking care of ourselves and we're taking care of, that's a community thing. That's a social relationship thing. So I think if we have a narrative that comes out of this, that says we didn't do it just because of ventilators and just because of masks and just because of $2 trillion spent, we did this because we participated in a community that had to do this for itself and for the members of that community. If that narrative prevails, that will be a tremendous move forward because I mean, one of my diagnoses for the current issues we have largely in the political sphere and indeed in the economic sphere is that we have swung the pendulum has swung so far to radical individualism that we have given up any sense of the fact that we're in this together it's, it's me and my business and and the the economy has has promoted that because individual consumers are the ones that business go after and the political sphere has promoted that because it does not want to you know spend money and 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 take care of those people in society whether they're children or the disabled or the mentally ill or whatever so if we come out of it saying we did this certainly with the help of government but we did this because we're a community wow mm. You talk about an aspiration. You yeah. talk about a wonderful, wonderful time. And I, and I would hope that would happen. I'm not going to predict that's going to happen. But I would like people to reflect on this time as a time when the community came together. And it does that. You know, the New York after the attacks of 9-11 and during wars and, and during hurricanes. And we, we lived through Hurricane Harvey in, in Houston. Uh, people came together. But after a while, it kind of went away. I don't yeah. know whether this is going to be permanent or not, but that's my aspiration. I would love it to be. You know, there have been a lot of recent comparisons to the Spanish flu pandemic uh, sure. in the ninth, late 19 uh, teens. Yeah. And David Brooks, um, you know, who writes for the New York Times, one of their more conservative writers and a guy who's writing I really like generally, um, he's, he said that he's been doing a lot of reading about the fallout from the Spanish flu and that people really didn't talk about what happened during the Spanish flu because they were ashamed of how they behaved. Mm. So when you talk about a narrative that we might tell ourselves that's more positive and how we came together, 
I, boy, it would be nice, you know, if we really could do that. And it actually leads me to a question that Amy Pedretti raised in the chat. Um, you know about the three horizons, right? Um, and for those of you who don't know, horizon one is kind of where we're at, where we know things are kind of busted and janky, but like it's where we are, right? And horizon three is like way in the future and it's kind of the future we all would like to see. And then there's that messy middle part where getting from horizon one to horizon three it requires us to be in horizon two where things just feel busted up and like nothing's working and it's just super messy. And the, the research shows that the people who can frame the narrative for the third horizon, the people who start to own that narrative begin to win. Uh, and that does become the normal that society ends up moving, moving towards and perhaps I'm being a little too, maybe I'm having a little too much confirmation bias in this, but this is what I feel like is happening with the sustainability movement. We know that what we're doing isn't working. We have some technologies that could help us move through to a more sustainable future. But up until recently, that narrative about the sustainable future is ours hasn't been clearly defined. I think Greta Thornburg has helped do it. Now some of our largest companies are doing it when Microsoft steps up and says, not only are we gonna be carbon neutral, we're gonna be carbon neutral back to 1984 or whatever crazy thing that they just committed to. Those are things that are starting to make that third horizon narrative possible. So the question from Amy Pedretti is, is, you know, is this pandemic a moment for us to just be in a completely disgusting, messy middle, second horizon, and we have to start inventing that third horizon narrative? Or what would be your sense, Peter? Well, the three horizons, of course, is something that we, you use and we use a lot. And, and I, I, I want to share uh, a label that my colleague Andy Hines, who took over the Houston program, uh, puts on those three horizons because it's three different styles, three different mindsets that characterize each one. The first horizon, which is the present and maybe going away, but there the managerial mindset, efficiency, effectiveness, working in the system, not on the system, is what is, is the appropriate time for managers to do what they do so well, which is to create efficient, effective systems and on good day to do what it needs to what the system needs to be done. The third horizon is the visionary horizon. And these are people who during, not during disruptions, but during, quotes, normal times, equilibrium times, moral, you know, era, in, within the era, they're usually not listened to. They're crazy, they're off the, the beyond the pale, uh, they're fuzzy headed, blah, 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 blah. And now, as you say, now while the existing structures begin to collapse and or dissolve, we're beginning to, you know, anybody that has a good idea, we, oh, that's a great idea. So we're, we're sharing these ideas now. They're getting more currency in terms of discussion and appreciation and visibility than they did before. The middle horizon, the second horizon, however, so that's a visionary mindset, managerial mindset. The middle horizon is the entrepreneurial mindset. Entrepreneurs, whether it's in business or whether it's in government or NGOs, entrepreneurs usually are opportunists. They're trying to take advantage of the moment. Where's the niche? Where can I move this thing forward? And in that sense, uh, I think they are the ones who build. They're not just talking about the third horizon. They're actually moving us toward the third horizon with lots of failures and lots of mistakes. Entrepreneurism is not for the faint of heart. <laughs> it requires a tremendous amount of courage, but they're the people who are actually more, you know, kind of in a wobbly kind of a way, moving us through that second horizon to the third horizon. So the first is a managerial mindset, which is appropriate most of the time. The third is the visionary mindset, which needs to be listened to and becomes listened to more during this disruptive period. And it's the entrepreneurial mindset, the people who say, I can use this time to advance what I think are the values, the aspirations, and to create a better world for me, my family, my community, et cetera, et cetera. So I, I, I think the three horizon formula is great because all these three are, in, are present at all the time. What happens, however, is during 80% of the time or 90% of the time, the managerial mindset dominates. 
and entrepreneurs trying to do some things and visionaries are hardly paying any attention to. Now we're shifting towards a disruptive time where visionaries are being listened to and entrepreneurs see that they have more uh, time. And so the, 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 the gentleman you described that is proposing last year's budget for next year's budget is still in a managerial mindset. He has not realized that the system could go through this fundamental transformational change. And we, we help, but we're now we're talking visionary and we're talking entrepreneurs. And that's true in business and I think it's true in government as well. Um, I want to ask you a question. This one from, it's kind of a comment, but I'd love your feedback on it. It's Dan DeMoya Newton's, uh, he had two comments. One is he said, I'm a big fan of the technique to help people change their own minds by using I used to think that, dot, 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 <laughs> then I learned, dot, dot, dot. This helps build the logic stream to choose if that, uh, a better model for the future may be possible. And then he talks about um, Peter Senge's five ways to create shared vision, tell, sell, test, copy, co-create. In a crisis, he says, tell is often the best approach. I wonder, do you know about Senge's system here? Or do oh, you know yeah, but I, have a, I have a PowerPoint on that one too. It's you know, different, different ways to, I, I, don't, I don't see it as a better or worse. I see it, I use it to say, these are five different ways that can be used that are appropriate for the organization and for the culture of the organization. So if you try and do something co-creation, let me just take, I, I teach police officers here in California. If you try and co-create something in a police department or a military unit, you're not going to get a whole lot of takers. I mean, it sounds wonderful to us lefties and, and you know, and kind of, you know, touchy-feely participative people, but no, that's not going to work. So it, you choose the approach that you think is appropriate for this time. Now, when the existing person who is the teller is now discredited, or confused or not really following the change, then it's time maybe to choose a d another approach. So I don't think of it so much as a developmental, that it's better at the top and worse at the bottom. It's, it's which, is, which is the most appropriate way to create visions at this point. And I think in this case, we are shifting towards the more participative, because as I said, the conversation always results in a better judgmental decision about how much and how fast than any single person's telling or knowing. So there has to be, and, and that also then reinforces the community aspect. It, it moves away from the individualism. It removes away from there's somebody who's gonna come save us. I love John Gardner's phrase, we are the people we've been waiting for. <laughs> and so we, we're all in this and we all need to be part of the community that responds to this crisis and afterwards with making the world better as a result. So I, I don't think it's either or. I think one has to then, obviously, one style and the culture of the, of the group or community that one is looking for uh, and, and one is involved in is there are better ways of, of communicating visions, creating and communicating visions, and there are worse ways. Yeah. I wonder what you think about, I've been thinking a lot about this um, because, you know, a lot of cities are now appointing people to be in charge of something, you know, um, <laughs> you know, we, if they didn't do that before. What do you mean? <laughs> right, exactly. But we're calling in a military guy or gal to come in and do this piece. And in some ways I understand that. I mean, I was on a NATO briefing a couple of weeks ago and it was very clear that the, the health system is not designed to scale up 4,000 additional beds in a convention center, but by God, the military knows how to do that. So I get that. But my question is about language. And really my question for all of you is about language, but Peter, you, you, have, the, you have the microphone. Um, when, I, when I hear, uh, and it's not because I, ab I object to wartime metaphors, but I know that those, when pe language is powerful, and when people say, you know, we're in a war with an invisible enemy, and blah, 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 the thing that makes me nervous about that is that puts a construct in people's minds, that there is also a general who's going to know what to do, and we just need to follow the orders of, who, you know, what our orders are. And... That's one thing, but my experience as a futurist is it's a lot more useful to sort of think of the future as um, 
you know, I train in sword and martial arts. And it's a lot more helpful to think of things coming from many different angles and how to be agile and how to sort of move as a, you know, as a, as a group, as a flock, and not to have like a command and control hierarchical sort of mindset. So I wonder, what do you think about metaphor or, in, and, and if you agree with that, if you agree that language is important, what might be a more useful way of thinking about this moment we're in and how to language it? Um, the things we, we use metaphor to label things that we don't understand. So obviously human consciousness and how the brain works has been a mystery and is still a mystery to the present day. Uh, it used to be thought of as a locomotive engine. Uh, it used to be thought of as a telephone switchboard uh, where we plug different things in. It's now thought of as a computer processor and different functions are being processed by different modules and things like that. So uh, what is an organization? Or is it a machine? And in fact, that's the way we think of it. I taught systems thinking for a long time and we use machine metaphors. Uh, there is command and control, there, is, there are functions, there are relationships, uh, and that's one, that's one perspective, that's one narrative about it. And in that sense, yes. Command and control, orders, uh, authorities, resources, responsibilities, all of that is one of those. But there's a little known way of thinking of the org chart that's not the hierarchical uh, uh, organization of authority, but the organization of relationships. It's called sociometric, a map of who really talks to whom, who, who is with whom, who are the nodes, who are the groups, what are the communities. And that's a different view of a system not as a machine, but as an organism. And that came out of the 1980s and the insights in complexity science and adaptive, uh, uh, adaptive uh, complex adaptive systems. And that is not instead of, but in addition to thinking about our organizations, not as top-down authoritative directive structures, but as living organisms, just like our bodies. Our body is not a machine. It doesn't, it, we have multiple systems. They communicate, but they're largely independent. And indeed, every single cell in the body is its own entity. And it only communicates with those things that are in its immediate neighborhood. There's no top down. There's, it's, a, it's an organism. So thinking of our communities as organisms, thinking of our organizations and city government even as organisms, rather than as top-down hierarchical systems, or let not, not rather than, but in addition to. So there, are some, there, there does need to be some authority, but there also does need to be some organic qualities to how we approach and how we work in organizations. So it's both and. It's not, yeah, you can, you can become too militaristic. You can become too organic. So it's, a tra right. it's, it's try and find that right balance between both the org chart, as we think of it, and the sociometric chart as, as a set of relationships, not just as a set of authorities. I so would, yeah. that's the way I think that we can counteract the, the, any kind of downside to using military and, and authoritative uh, narratives and metaphors. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, um, there's a, I think there is a level of sensitivity to what is needed at the time, right? Because there are moments, like Dan was saying, there are moments when people need to be told what to do. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Yep. You know, yep. uh, and then there are moments when we need to uh, be co-creative um, right. with each other. Uh, Rhonda Morton says, beehive, that might be the way that we want to think about uh, this, mm -hmm. this exactly. creation. Yeah, the, the, the metaphor I use is that building a house is a different process than growing a garden. Build a house, you have to do every step yourself. You've got to lay the foundation, nail the boards together, put up the walls, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. There's nothing that that does for itself. But growing a garden is establishing the conditions for seeds to, to germinate and to grow. We still have to do some things. So we have to provide water and light and air and all of that. But we let the garden be the garden and we let it develop on its own. It's, it's, it's just like uh, the, the other metaphor now that we have this new granddaughter, it's, it's growing, it's raising a child uh, versus uh, building a building. 
uh, there is no way that you can you can do it by program by authoritative directive it has to you create the right conditions but then the child literally takes over and grows themselves in one way or the other so those are the kind of metaphors that i prefer to counterbalance not to, to replace but to counterbalance the authoritative metaphors thank you um there's there have been some additional questions around like the future of the family and um I, i've said like no one is ever going to question again how much we pay teachers because now <laughs> that we have to homeschool our kids um it is bananas um do you have thoughts peter on that new that family the future the future of family how that changes uh you know, again, you throw me back with these great questions. Um, as I said, there will be some people who enact the change by getting out of their families, it's things, the systems that were not working for them. And that, that will be tragic and that will be unfortunate, probably better in the long run, but, uh, but that will happen. I think families that go through this together uh, will feel closer. Uh, a lot of families, because of the pressures of the world, the work mostly, um, a lot of families are not tight. A lot of families are not together much. Kids are on screens, uh, parents are working, stressful and things like that. I think for the time being, being forced together, you'll either find that this is not good and we're going to get out of this thing as quickly as possible, or this is really a time for us to be a family. This is a time for us to, to, to be closer where we can't go to work, uh, we can't you know, be in separate places together. We have to be together. So again, there's a continuum here. You know, is this a snap back to the families that we had before, or will there be some shift towards a narrative that says, no, this is a lot more valuable than we thought of before. And that's what these times teach us. They teach us that we're, we're, we really are together. We're a community and we can't go towards complete kumbaya, but by the same token, we, the atomization in society, I think, has reached extreme levels. And this may push even in families and certainly in communities to be closer together. So let me ask a few selfish questions for some of the people who I know are on the call today. Uh, so one thing that I wonder about is what you think are the upper and lower limits for local government? So and by upper and lower limits, what I mean is kind of a worst case scenario post COVID for local government and a most optimistic, surprisingly successful uh, vision for local government post COVID. Um, you're all familiar, I'm sure, but I don't know that the general public is as familiar with the value of local and state government uh, and gets the reputation and the credit. Um, a big fan, I'm sure you know, uh, of local government is James Fallows, writes for the Atlantic. And he used, <laughs> he used the Atlantic's money to fly his private plane around the country and talk to folk exactly like you, maybe some of you actually talked to him, and wrote a very, he said, it's fine. It, the, the, the government is working. We have, unfortunately, to use the military metaphor again, I believe, a war on government, uh, that the marketplace is the answer and the government is not. And this starts in the 80s, I believe. And that has, again, it, there may be some truth to that at the beginning, but uh, it's the become extreme and the pendulum has swung way to the extreme on that one. That's not true, I don't think, so much of local government. I think local government is doing this much more responsibly and much more clearly. Unfortunately, the media doesn't give local government, nor does the public. It's not as entertaining. I mean, if the media, the news as entertainment is almost more than the news as information, where the fights, the, 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 the gotchas, the, you know, the, the horse races at the national level and the international level, unfortunately, overtake and the people believe that's government. But local government is so much more valuable and useful, and it affects people's lives in many ways more so than the other. So this might actually be a time when just like when people appreciate their teachers more, they may appreciate their local governments more. Again, aspirational, not a prediction, but this is the time I think, I believe, when local government has done a lot more 
for people. Now, we are the kind, we are decentralized society, a decentralized country, uh, all local government did in China, so marvelously, was to take orders. <laughs> and that's an authoritative top down. We do not have an authoritative top down. We are a decentralized um, system that is more organic in its, in its structure and in its processes. So I think it's possible the local government could come out of this as one of the heroes. I know I'm envisioning like I'm envisioning everybody out on their front porch clapping local <laughs> government leaders home all of us outside the Dane County city of Madison buildings who rying people at 5 p.m. I'm gonna so well, you that. all saw the video of the people banging on their pots above the healthcare workers in Italy so yep. that all of those things yeah there I think uh, and and obviously uh, and not only just for local government, but for the healthcare system, which is the front lines of this war, if you will, um, the feeling that we have for those folks, they were always kind of heroes. We certainly spent a lot of money on it, but their, their, their heroism is, uh, I heard a podcast of a EMS manager of 50 people uh, in Brooklyn. Uh, six of them had already been identified and were at home, not one of those EMS people had quit. Yep. That's what I mean by community, and that's local government too. That's right, thank you. Peter, my last question, I warned everybody uh, that I was gonna be asking you this question. Right. Um, I wanna talk about Overton's window. Um, you know this well, right, that there's a window pane of possible policy or ideas, and it moves based on circumstances. and. There is literally a draft blog sitting in my drafts right now about uh, this is why I think Bernie Sanders won't just give up and say, go ahead, Joe Biden. Because I think what Bernie ha is rightly sensing is that what could fit into Overton's window is, is different today than it was two weeks ago than it was a month ago. So um, for those of you who are on the chat, I set the, I set the uh, link to the image and I sent the link to the Wikipedia entry on what Overton's window is. So for those of you who are looking at the link right now, the image on the far right, right, there's from more freedom to less freedom and Overton's window moves, right? Mm -hmm. So there are things on the very outside of Overton's window, they're not within the pain that are unthinkable radical. That we just wouldn't do them, right? But then there are things within the window that are sensible, popular, and become policy, right? On either side of the, of the top or bottom edge of the window. And I wonder, Peter, you know, if you were gonna place, I know you're not necessarily a betting person, so if you were gonna borrow somebody <laughs> else's money, like if I said, here's $100, <laughs> Peter. Uh, here's $1,000, let's make it a little more interesting. Here's $1,000, Peter, don't lose my damn money. Um, what is something that you bet is gonna slide into Overton's window over the next 24 months? What is one bet you would make that is going to become acceptable that a month ago was not acceptable? Well, I think I've already, we already talked about it. The fact that we see ourselves more as a community than as a set of competing individuals who need to take care of ourselves. Uh, we do need to take care of ourselves. We need to be responsible, take care of our loved ones, our elderly, our children. Uh, but at the same time, we need to also rely upon a community that is uh, also moving to take care of others in that community. I mean, if we're a family in that sense, uh, where, where we need to depend on each other. If there's, if there's a slide up, it's towards, uh, and this is David Brooks, one of my favorite commentators, doing exactly the same thing. I mean, he doesn't use the term uh, you know, moral decay, but he really does talk a lot about this atomization and this loss of a common set of values. And as a conservative, he's talking about That's that, right. uh, moderate conservative, certainly. So if there is a hope and where this window slides up, I don't think it's in Bernie's direction, frankly. I mean, I think he's got the issue. Inequality and who runs the society is clearly important. Um, I, don't, I don't see the connection so much as the window moving up that scale of mm -hmm. inequality, more or less, but of community from individualism to more community might be uh, where we are surprised at, at how much uh, it does does happen. Now I hurry on to say, through the tragedies we've been, that's a temporary that's a temporary condition. People come together and then they go back to real life. And and can we as individuals and in our communities 
foster that so it doesn't just snap back yeah. to the same old same old. That's yeah. that's my hope, and that's what at, at, at you know within the education system is where I work is where I hope to 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 bring some of that. Great, Peter. It's time for us to let you go and to I love this, this, you guys. Thanks for hanging in. Go. My yeah. gosh, <laughs> you didn't get a chance. I, I wasn't watching the chat. I was paying attention to to what we were talking about. But it's a it's it's a joy to see this number of people. Civil service, I think probably mostly because I know Rebecca's business. Yeah. I want to applaud you. Uh, not only just on this call, but on the kind of things that you do for your communities every single day. This is a window. The window is opening. And after this is over, it's time to make change. And I, I, I welcome, I welcome the changes that, that come about here. Thanks, everybody, for your hour. Thank you, Peter, for your hour. We, I love you guys. And uh, we'll, we'll be back trying to help you as much as we can in the next weeks and months. Take care of yourselves and take care of each other. Okay. Okay. Thanks, Rebecca. Bye, everybody.